Hey, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today, we'll talk about pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Yesterday, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has passed away due to pancreatic cancer. Rest in peace. Okay, what is cancer? In pathology, we have five different terms. We have hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia, dysplasia, and finally, neoplasia. Neoplasia is the one that could be cancer. It could be benign, not cancer, or it could be malignant, cancer. Hypertrophy is increased size of the cell. Hyperplasia is increased number. Metaplasia is when one tissue type is changed into another tissue type in the same category. For instance, epithelium, to another epithelium or connective tissue to another connective tissue but you cannot jump to a different category an epithelial cell cannot just become a connective tissue cell dysplasia what does this mean difficulty plasia is growth so it's difficulty growing or an abnormal growth neoplasia what does neo mean it means new plasia new growth this is the tumor if there is one word that I want you to remember is that neoplasia is a freaking mass. It's an abnormal mass of tissue whose growth exceeds and is uncoordinated with that of normal tissue. And it persists even after cessation of the stimulus that caused the growth in the first place. In other words, cancer is nasty. There is a difference between tumor and cancer because cancer is a malignant tumor. So not all tumors are cancers because they could be benign. However, all cancers are tumors. So tumor, same thing as neoplasia, same thing as any disease that ends in oma, melanoma, adenoma, adenocarcinoma, all of these are tumors or neoplasias. Then we divide them into benign, not a big deal, or malignant, could be a huge freaking deal. Malignant tumors or cancers are divided into carcinomas, these are tumors of epithelial tissue, or sarcomas, tumors of connective tissue. When the carcinomas metastasize, they love to go to the lymph, at least in the beginning. When sarcomas metastasize, they love to go to the blood. Today we'll talk about pancreatic cancer, which is an adenocarcinoma. Where do you think it metastasizes first? Uh, to lymph nodes. And there is a huge difference between the survival rates of node-positive pancreatic cancer and node-negative pancreatic cancer. Polyclonal versus monoclonal. Polyclonal, when the growth originate from many cells. We started with three cells, this became two, two, and another two. This is polyclone because it started from three origins. However, monoclonal, one crazy freaking cell. And then it divides like mad. This is monoclonal because the origin was one crazy cell. All non-neoplastic growths, the good ones, are polyclonal. All the benign neoplasms are monoclonal and most of the malignant are monoclonal. One crazy cell. What helps you differentiate between polyclonal or monoclonal is the ratio. Let's look at the ratio in the first generation. 3 kappa to 1 lambda. And then when they divide 6 to 2. Oh, according to mathematics, 6 over 2 is the same thing as 3 over 1, at least where I grew up. So by definition, this is polyclonal, usually not a big deal. However, if the ratio change from 3 to 1 into 100 to 1, this is monoclonal. This could be cancer. Some cancer facts. It's a growth with no control. It's a growth with no limit. There is no evident cause. So if I ever hear you say that X causes cancer, I'll smack your gluteal region. We don't know the cause. We only talk about risk factors because correlation is not the same as causation. So whenever you see something, oh, red meat causes cancer. Oh, that's a blogger at best. If you want to say red meat could be associated with certain types of cancer, this is at least a fair argument that can be examined empirically. Cancer has no useful function. Cancer arises from any type of cells. Cancer could be non-functioning or it could be functioning what we call a paraneoplastic syndrome. Why don't we have a cure for cancer? I've no idea what the flip you're talking about. On hearing that a New Yorker is hit by a car once every 30 minutes, the listener replied, gee, he must get awfully tired of that. <laughs> What's the problem with this kind of reasoning? It's not the same New Yorker every time. So New Yorker is a statistical category, not a single person every time. Same thing, cancer is a statistical category, including gazillion diseases. It's not a single disease. Basal cell carcinoma of the skin is not a big deal. Stage four pancreatic adenocarcinoma at the head of the pancreas is the end of your life. Lumping them together in one category is confusing if you have no idea what the flip you're talking about. 
Why don't we have a cure for cancer? Basal cell carcinoma has a cure. It's called excisional biopsy. You just remove it. Chronic myeloid leukemia has a cure. It's called imatinib, dasatinib, nilutinib, etc. They cure about 95% of cases. And where I grew up, we call this a cure. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia has a cure. It's called combination chemotherapy. Not as good as imatinib. This works about like 90% only. Hodgkin's lymphoma has a cure. It's called the ABVD chemo regimen. Most stage 1 local cancers have a cure. It's called surgical resection. However, pancreatic cancer doesn't have a cure. So if you want to say, oh, why don't we have a cure for pancreatic cancer? This is at least a good question. So please don't just run around saying, why don't we have a cure for cancer? Okay? And there is another myth. We will never find a cure for cancer until we find the root cause of cancer. That's a bunch of nonsense. Let me give you an example. Basal cell carcinoma. We have no idea what causes it. We have some risk factor. Could be genetic, could be exposure to sunlight, could be bazillion other things. So what's the treatment of basal cell carcinoma? Even though we do not know the root cause, it's called excisional biopsy. Let's say that 50 years from now, we understand beyond a shadow of doubt that it's a genetic disease and has nothing to do with the sunlight. You know what the treatment will be? An excisional biopsy. You just remove it. Let's say that we discovered later that it's not genetic and it's entirely due to exposure to sunlight. The treatment will still be an excisional biopsy. Finding the root cause will help with prevention, not necessarily with finding a cure. The difference between benign and malignant is very important. Benign is capsulated, malignant is non-capsulated. Benign has polarity, but malignant has lost its polarity. What is polarity? Polarity is like this. When the cell is trying to grow, it looks exactly like the other cells. But cancer, no, there is loss of polarity. This evil cell does not look like the rest. Recurrence, benign, there is no recurrence after removal. Malignant, there is recurrence after removal. In many cases, not all of them. Metastasis. Benign tumors never, never, ever metastasize. Malignant, they do metastasize. This is a very important question that unfortunately many medical students don't get. How cancer kills people? Oh, anemia, cachexia, which is severe weight loss, organ destruction, metastases, obstruction of intestinal ventricle, barrier tree, etc., and paraneoplastic syndrome. Pancreatic cancer is evil because it can cause almost all of these. Cancer management. Sometimes you just watch and wait if the tumor is very slow or indolent or if the patient is very old and has gazillion other things. And if he dies, he will probably die from these other things. In that case, managing the tumor aggressively might cause more harm than good. And then the trifecta, surgery, radiation and chemotherapy. If you listen to your woke anatomy professor, he or she will tell you that we have only one pancreas. But physiologically speaking, that's not true. We have two pancreas. We have the exocrine pancreas and we have the endocrine pancreas. The endocrine pancreas secretes hormones such as insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. Exocrine secretes digestive enzymes into the GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract specifically, your small intestine, particularly your duodenum. Precisely the second part of the duodenum. Most accurately, the postromedial aspect of the second part of the duodenum. Okay, we get it. So pancreatic cancer is a problem with the exocrine or the endocrine. It's usually the exocrine. The mass will arise here in the exocrine pancreas. You see that? That's a pancreatic duct. The duct has secretion. Where do secretions come from? From glands. Gland means adeno. So that's why we call it pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Pancreatic cancer, exocrine pancreas, cancer head of the pancreas, most of the time it's in the head. It's an adenocarcinoma arising from exocrine ductal epithelium. Because it's ductal, we call it adeno. Because it's epithelium, we call it a carcinoma. Cancer head of the pancreas or adenocarcinoma of the pancreas epidemiology is the second most common GI cancer, second only to the colorectal cancer. Risk factors, males, old age, cigarette smoking, chronic pancreatitis or hereditary pancreatitis, obesity, diabetes, cirrhosis, and high saturated fat diet. Location of pancreatic cancer, most of the time it's in the head. It could also be in the body or the tail. Pathogenesis, it's associated with some genetic mutations such as the KRAS gene mutation, the SMAD4 inactivation, the CDKN2A inactivation, 
and the tumor suppressor gene, TP53 inactivating. When you inactivate a tumor suppressor gene, there is no suppression of tumors. Now you get tumors. Signs and symptoms. Many patients are asymptomatic until it invades other structures, then it can cause symptoms, which makes pancreatic cancer very difficult to diagnose because most patients, oh, I'm fine. Uh, I'm not complaining of anything. There is no reason to do a CT scan of the abdomen for every patient and then repeat it. It's just not feasible. Obstructive jaundice, epigastric pain that radiates to the back, weight loss and anorexia, fatigue or weakness, Trousseau sign. We have two Trousseau signs in medicine. One of them is for tetany, you know, Trousseau sign. When you wrap the blood pressure cuff around the arm of the patient, you will find carpal spasm if the patient has tetany. This is Trousseau sign. But now we have a totally different Trousseau sign. It's called superficial migratory thrombophlebitis. Let's break that down. What does itis mean? Inflammation. What does phleb mean? It means vein. What does thrombo mean? There is thrombosis or clots. What does migratory mean? It goes to my arm, then my leg, then my abdomen. It just migrates. It will disappear here and appear here. And then it disappears here and appears here. In my previous video about vitamin K deficiency, I've told you that one of the causes of vitamin K deficiency or any other fat-soluble vitamin deficiency could be one of three things. A problem in the liver or bile, a problem in the pancreas, or a problem in the wall of the gut. So if you have a problem in your pancreas, you will not be able to reabsorb the fat or the fat-soluble vitamins. Pancreatic cancer is a huge mass. This mass can obstruct the common bile duct, so now there is no bile. And we need bile to digest fat and fat-soluble vitamins. And that's why pancreatic cancer can lead to steatorrhea. Loss of fat in the stool and loss of fat-soluble vitamins in the stool. The location of this stinking cancer is really horrible because it can obstruct the common bile duct, leading to accumulation of bile here. And then uh, bitterubin is going to just leak to your blood, leading to jaundice. You know what else? Bile salts can leak to your blood, leading to itching. The bile is not moving. Cholestasis, which can increase risk of gallbladder stones. And if you read about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she had a procedure in her bile duct just a few months ago. This could probably to remove the stones or to relieve the obstruction caused by the pancreatic cancer. Probably an ERCP. Steatorrhea. The patient will say, doctor, my stool is very greasy. It's like has a lot of fat and it's foul smelling. It floats on the toilet and it's difficult to flush. And don't forget the superficial migratory thrombophlebitis. So obstruction is one complication. Another complication is metastasis. It can metastasize to the liver. In that case, it will give you a right upper quadrant abdominal pain. The pancreatic cancer by itself could be painless or it could lead to an epigastric pain that radiates in the back when you lay down on your bed, on your back at night. Metastasis to the liver can also lead to hepatomegaly. Pancreatic cancer can also metastasize to Fercos node, which is the superior clavicular lymph node. Remember, it's a carcinoma. Carcinomas love to go to the lymph nodes, while sarcomas love to go to the blood. Quick question, what other cancer went to the Fercos node? Let me know the answer in the comment section. How do we diagnose pancreatic cancer? From the history, jaundice, steatorrhea, Donald Payne, anorexia, anemia, physical findings, jaundice, Courvoisier sign, which is palpable gallbladder, usually painless. Now contrast that with cholecystitis, it is palpable gallbladder and it is painful. And we call that Murphy's sign. Trousseau sign, which is superficial migratory thrombophobias, comes on the exam all the time. And Sister Mary Joseph node, which is periumbilical metastasis of the pancreatic cancer. Radiology, abdominal ultrasound. But the answer to the exam question on the exam, here is a 69-year-old male who has been smoking his lungs out for his entire freaking life. And he also drinks alcohol. He has chronic pancreatitis and diabetes, etc. And now he's complaining of yellow discoloration of the skin, itching, fatigue, weight loss, some painful dark skin lesions all over his body. What should you do next? The answer is CT scan of the abdomen. That's the best. And then labs, you can also do the CA99. That's a tumor marker for pancreatic cancer. You might also find CEA. And this is also common with colorectal cancer. 
while liver cancer has the alpha feta protein. What if you have a patient with many, many, many big lesions or big tumors in his liver and he's positive for CEA? Oh, that's a metastatic colon cancer. So it's a colon cancer starting in the colon and metastasized to the liver. That's why it's still carrying its CEA marker. Biopsy, you do percutaneous pancreatic biopsy, usually a fine needle aspiration under guidance of ultrasound or CT scan, or you can do an endoscopic ultrasound or EUS and guide the biopsy. How do we manage cancer of the pancreas? First, there is no cure. Second, it has a horrible prognosis. And then the question is, is the patient a surgical candidate? Can we operate on this patient? Can we remove the freaking tumor? You ask yourself, is the tumor localized with no invasion of major blood vessels and no distant metastasis? If yes, yep, this patient may be a surgical candidate. What should you do? Surgery. What kind of surgery? A pancreatico duodenectomy, which means ectomy means removal of the duodenum and the pancreas. We call this the Whipple procedure, not to be confused with Whipple disease by the Triferema Whippelli. Some chemotherapy might help, such as 5-FU and gemcitabine. But if the pancreatic cancer has metastasized to distant locations or has invaded major blood vessels, there is no point of doing surgery. It's not going to help. The patient is unfortunately going to die. So you offer supportive care. You might try some experimental chemotherapy, especially gemcitabine. You should know this. Let's rank cancers by the instance. Most common, breast in women, prostate in men. Lung cancer is number two, colorectal is number three. But when it comes to death, which one of these cause death the most? Lung is number one, breast prostate is number two, so it's like a scissors, but colorectal cancer maintains the third place. Good doctors know all of this. What they do not know is that pancreatic cancer is number four. It is evil. What's the prognosis of cancer head of the pancreas? If it's node negative, which means it has not metastasized to lymph nodes, the five-year survival rate is 30%. So if we have 100 patients with pancreatic cancer that is node negative, 30 of these 100 people will live after five years. But unfortunately, seven, he will be dead. If it's node positive, it's worse. Only 10% will live and 90% will pass away. And this was the sad story of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was the second woman to serve as a justice in the Supreme Court, and she served for 27 years in the Supreme Court. Rest in peace, Justice. Famous people who had pancreatic cancer, Steve Jobs, Aretha Franklin, Sally Ride, Donna Reed, and the Egyptian journalist Ali Amin, or his brother Mustafa Amin. I really do not remember, so sorry. Next, we'll talk about scleroderma and the autonomic nervous system. So please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to get my premium courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.